I'm here with Niall Breslin, and Niall is a tremendous advocate for mindfulness and giving people the tools to help deal with a racing mind and panic disorder. And for those of our listeners who don't know you, Niall, just a little bit of background, because I think like many people who fall into this space, we fall into it because of our own issues and it gives us mm. kind of that bit of an understanding. So, so a little bit of background. Yeah, I suppose the starting point is if anybody who knew me 20 years ago would now know I'm a mindfulness therapist would fall off their chair and laugh and go, that's just not, that's not, that's not, that's not happening. I grew up, I'm, you know, I'm 42 years of age. I grew up in Ireland and in the 90s, I started experiencing quite serious uh, relationships with my mental health. I moved to Israel when I was 13 with my dad. He was in the UN there was an element of post-traumatic kind of stress there. There was a, 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 a war there when I was living there at the time. But also for those listening outside Ireland, Ireland had a quite abusive schooling system, primary school system where corporal punishment was quite, quite unfortunately common. Um, so I was unfortunately at the receiving end of many beatings by uh, Christian brothers in Ireland. And th- I kind of carried this into my teenage years. But I was also the kind of captain of my school football team. I was playing rugby. I had all this great stuff going on. But I was silently fighting this quite chronic panic disorder from the age of 13, where I was, where I was having often two, three panic attacks a day. Uh, and the only time I actually could breathe properly is when I was running or training or being on a pitch, ironically. And I carried that through my entire life. And I became a professional rugby player. I then moved into music, as you do. I worked in the bank. I went into academia I did all these different things in the belief that the next thing will save save me or solve this problem but it doesn't you can't outrun this and I learned that the hard way and then I en- ended up being a, a coach on the TV show The Voice in Ireland and had a pretty bad panic attack before a live show and that was my kind of catalyst to change and from that day on I've done everything and anything I can to not just express what I went through but help other people deal with it and then I look at different elements of mental health I look at the spiritual element of it I look at the functional element where breathing is a huge part of it and I also look at the kind of both the psychological the sociological element of it how does culture affect how we feel about ourselves so all this you can't talk about the human condition unless you're willing to talk about the full spectrum it's com- it's complex it's nuanced but it is uh the core of my being and something I'm very passionate about. And do you find when you were growing up as well, that you were living in your head a lot or that your mind was racing? Yeah, I, I used to joke that I felt I was possessed by the devil and which was viable option in the nineties in Ireland to be fair. But (laughs) I I had this thing where my thoughts, I remember thinking about my thoughts there. They, they, they were so fast and so dynamic and so rinsing and they would exhaust me because anyone who's dealt with any form of an anxiety disorder, it's amazing. Anxiety is phenomenal. It actually will make you think of the most impossible thing that could happen and it will convince you it will happen. It's so good at that. But the one thing I learned in my life is that your brain is not there to hurt you. It is not. It, it's actually fundamentally there to do the opposite. It's there to protect you, to keep you safe. And sometimes it does too good a job and it, it's kind of warning you. And the interesting thing about the brain is it doesn't know the difference between real and perceived threat. It doesn't have the ability to make that decision because Mm -hmm. if it did, we'd all be dead. And I think that's what I learned the hard way. The brain is this phenomenal tool and it's there. It's a security guard and thoughts are kind of, are kind of the thing that keeps the security guard on his toes. And my thoughts were deeply destructive and there were, based in patterns. So I did, I was a catastrophizer. I was a black and white thinker. I was like, if one tiny thing went wrong, it would be my fault. I couldn't see beyond that. But the paradox to that, which was really, really strange, Patrick, was I was succeeding a lot in my external life. I was, as I said, quite a good athlete in a band of amazing parents. I have a loving, stable, middle class country upbringing. My dad was in the army. My mom was a teacher. So it, I don't fit into the equation we like to have for mental health and people who struggle with their mental health. And anyone listening to this, you don't need to have experienced something to have to struggle with this this racing mind or whatever you want to call it. And then there's the ruminating mind. 
And the ruminating mind is the mind that falls into shame, guilt, regret, and where you're completely lost in the past and you can, you're, you're, you're looking at everything and you're using words like I should have, I should have, I should have. And that's deeply destructive as well. And often within mental health, we say a ruminating mind will bring us closer to mood disorders and then a kind of a, an anxious overthinking mind will will drive anxiety disorders. Um, and I was I was a bit of both, to be honest with you. Mm. I was a cocktail of both, but I, I was a deep thinker and I also con- consistently worried about other people all the time, which I wasn't very good at dealing with. And maybe you achieved what you achieved because you've got perfectionist tendencies. And I sometimes wonder people with perfectionist tendencies, they set so high demands on themselves mm. that yeah. it's a stressor in itself. And also you were going into sports and music. Maybe that was your outlet. Well, I I had this belief that the only way I could fundamentally be happy is if I achieve things. And I'm here to say achievement is really important and goals are really important. Absolutely. You know, people want to be promoted. They want to achieve things. Of course we do. It's in our nature. The problem is we're creating a world, Patrick, where that's all that matters now. It's so I call it the neoliberal self for everything we do is now transactional. What can I get out of you? What's in this for me? How do I show how good I am, how kind I am, how talented I am constantly? So what happens is when you're doing that all the time, there's no room left for living. And you go on any social media platform now, you'll find some guru or some incredible athlete telling you how worthless and lazy you are because you're sitting down or you're resting or you're breathing or you're meditating. Or like, why would you be doing that? You know, you, you need to be you need to be going out. You gotta work. There's only 24 hours in the day. You gotta work. And I'm here going, nonsense. Because any anyone, including yourself, knows that the mind has a bandwidth. And if you fill it constantly, you will rinse yourself. So the big thing I'm really passionate about, not just with breathing and mindfulness, is rest. Rest. How do we rest? How do we know when to rest? How do we create quality rest? So when we do get going and you do want to take on the world and you do want to achieve, you have a full gas tank to do it. The problem is we're, we're, we're operating off an empty gas tank and it, it, that's what I worry about in the modern world. In terms of your mind, okay, so your mind was quite active. And I'm assuming that when people are ruminating that their attention is, is caught in the past. Mm-hmm. And when they have a racing mind, their attention is jumping to the future. So they're not actually living in the present. Um, have you reduced your thought activity? Has it, has it reduced and how did you reduce it? You see, that's a really good question about mindfulness. So I, I was actually reading that, you probably saw that research that came out, I think yesterday or the day before around functional breathing and mindfulness and how functional breathing is actually better for relaxation than mindfulness and meditation. I didn't see the research, but I've yeah. been saying it for, for a yeah, few I years. Yeah, I know you've been saying it. I, it was, Andrew Huberman put out up a piece and I went through it this morning and it's really, it's pretty, it's everything you've, things like physiological size and box breathing and, and functional breathing is is a, a core way of, of developing calm and relaxation. The issue I have with that is, is that researcher, it was a, I think it was a meta-analysis, kind of compared it to mindfulness. They're not the same thing. We need to stop the comparison between breath work and mindfulness. Yes, in mindfulness, you use the breath as an anchor of your attention. But what mindfulness is, is about gaining insight into your mind. It's about understanding your mind. It's about creating self-awareness. It's about creating understanding and diffusing yourself from thought. So not being married to thought and understanding that thoughts are not are just mental events. They're not real and you're not your thoughts. That's the real power of mindfulness meditation. And unfortunately, now we're fusing them. And we're also we're putting them in competition because people are going, well, look, I just want to relax. If you just want to relax, breath work is probably the best thing for you to be doing. But if you want to gain insight in how to re- you're reacting, how you deal with your thoughts, what type of thought patterns you have, how do you communicate, how do you behave in certain situations? Mindfulness meditation is insight meditation. That's why it's called what it is. So what I started to do with my thoughts is I used to believe that mindfulness meditation was a raising thought. Get rid of them. So you just sit there in perfect harmony, listening to whale music and everything is grand. I find functional breathing far better for that because there's a there's a function. There is there is a set time. Really, generally, you kind of set yourself I'm going to 10 minutes. I'm going to do my cadence breathing or whatever it is you're going to do. I find that much easier to, to relax me and to bring me right down. But mindfulness meditation, I sit and I start to notice first my mind is drifting and the mind will drift 
that's what minds do. Get over it. Don't be angry with it. It will drift. And what happens with the mind then, it goes down rabbit holes. So you'll have this initial thought and you'll be like, I forgot to ring Mary. And then you'll think, oh, God, Mary already hates me. It's going to be so awkward when I see Mary. Will I get a pizza later? I have so many calories in the pizza. Oh, will I go to the gym before? Now Now you're down a rabbit hole and now you've created an emotional charge and now you're anxious. So what we do in mindfulness is you still have the thought that you forgot to ring Mary. But in that moment, you go, OK, Mary, and you come back to your breath. And it's actually in that moment that you're diffusing from thought and you're being mindful. That's actually, that's the act of mindfulness is being aware of where the mind is and how it's drifting. And some days you might think of Mary 50 times in a minute or some days you won't really think of Mary at all. And that's the mind. It is not transient. It's constantly changing. And what I find beautiful about that is you can sit with everything. You can sit with the good, the bad and the ugly. And you can, you can, you can actually be comfortable in it. And you can feel where you feel your anxiety and that's insight and that's a powerful learning. And then you can bring that into therapy. You can bring that into your relationships, functional breathing. And also in saying that there was a time in my life where functional breathing was just not on the agenda for me because I had a immensely negative relationship with my breath because my panic attacks revolved around breathlessness or fighting for breath. So anytime I focused on my breath, I would have a panic attack. So functional breathing wasn't on the cards for me. So I had to learn to do that. I had to, and it was actually mindfulness that allowed me become stronger with my breath. And what I started to do that really helped me in mindfulness was I focused on the movement of my breath. I didn't focus on it. So I just focused on the rise and the fall. And I put my hand on my belly and I would just focus on what that felt like. And that is what started to change my relationship with breathing. And then once I got more confident with my breath, I moved into functional breathing where I was like, right, how can I actively do something in this five to 10 minute period that relaxes me or focuses me or gets me going for a particular thing? So that's why I think the functionality of breath work and understanding how to breathe properly has to be at an integral part of anybody's uh, support or conditioning for their mental or physical health. But I also think it's important that breath work coaches understand how language around breathing can really be can really be different for different people. So somebody with panic disorder or somebody who who has breathlessness because of anxiety, they don't want to talk about this. They do not want to break. So you need to be aware of that and you need to be aware of how do I bring this to the table? How can I help? You know, because some of the thing, you know, that you, me and you work with things like air hunger. Mm. There was a, there was a period in my life that would have been the single worst thing that could have been said to me because that would have drove me into a deep panic attack. And but then I understand the physiology of it. I just think it's really important that the psychology of it is really at the forefront of people's attention when they're working with vulnerable people. Mm, I would agree. I made mistakes, plenty of mistakes with panic disorder. I put one guy into accident in emergency from doing breath holds mm. and oh, totally unintentional, but of course yeah. you learn from your, your, your mistakes. Um, I'm going to come back to mindful because sometimes people may not know, they might have heard the word all around. You hear it everywhere, but what does it mean? So, does it mean that you kind of stand back and you observe what's going on in the mind, that you're paying attention to your thinking? And the other question that I'm going to have, Niall, is, is it during a formal session that you're paying attention to your thinking? Or what's your daily practice? Like, would you kind of, um, if you get two minutes here and two minutes there, do you kind of stand back and just observe what's going on in the mind? Is it formal or do you bring it into your way of life? Yeah, it's a really good question as well. So mindfulness, the psychological definition of mindfulness is paying attention to the present moment without judgment. So that doesn't really mean a lot. I often say to teenagers who are like, what's that mean? I say, well, I tell you what, stand into a nice cold shower. And the minute that water cuts the arse off, you tell me, are you thinking about yesterday or what you have to do tomorrow? They're like, no, I said, it's presence. It's being present in the present moment. Now, there's loads of, you know, neurological and physiological and psychological reasons why the present moment can be very, very supportive and comforting for people in terms of the central nervous system, in terms of, you know, the parasympathetic response and stuff like that. And, you know, you talk about it a lot. We don't need to really get into it. But I think when you talk about the subject of mindfulness, the most important word in that definition is non-judgment. So 
our entire life revolves around judgment, professionally, socially, personally. Everything we do is judged, appraised, seen. Mindfulness is a space where nobody's watching. It is nobody else's space, only your own. And nobody is judging you. And what I mean by judgment, when you sit to meditate, formally meditate, so the formal meditation is the sitting, a sitting meditation, a body scan, a mantra, whatever it is, and you sit to meditate, what happens is, as I said, the mind drifts. And our instinct will be to go, I'll come back here. You'd be angry with the mind. Why? Are you, what are you doing? I want you to be calm. Why are you, why are you going off in a, you know, a tangent here? Come back. So that's a judgment. I'm useless at this. I shouldn't be doing this. This is terrible. I knew I'd be terrible at this. My mind is too busy to be doing this crap. These are all judgments. So what we ask you to do in meditation is to be aware of these and see what it feels like to let them go. So the, the analogy I use is if you had a puppy and you went for a walk with that puppy and your puppy had a lead and the, one of those leads that goes a bit far and then you can lock it and bring it back, those leads. Now, when the puppy goes off and starts humping the neighbor's leg or doing whatever puppies do, you don't yank that puppy back. He's only being a curious puppy. That's what fucking puppies do. Don't You wouldn't be angry with that puppy and you wouldn't be aggressive with that puppy. You'd be gentle and kind and you go, come back here and stop humping the neighbor's leg. That's what you would do. It's the same as the mind. Don't be angry with the mind. It's only doing its job, but you don't want it to be busy. You're trying to calm it down. So just be aware. So bringing that non-judgment next time you sit, five minutes sitting, focusing on the breath. Oh my God, my mind is all over the place. That's okay. That's all right. Just maybe I had a busy day. Just come back to the breath. And then again, two seconds later, oh God, I have, okay, come around, come back to the breath. No need for anger, no need for judgment. That's the key to formal practice. Informal meditation is probably the most powerful form of meditation. So that's the conversation with a loved one where you're utterly present with them and you're looking at them and you're making eye contact and you're listening to them. You're completely submerged in their company. That's when you're having a coffee and it tastes like the greatest thing you've ever had in your life. And you're sitting with it. You're feeling the warmth coming into your chest and you're just taking a moment and you're becoming present in your day. These are really powerful. So I always say to people, try have 20 mindful moments a day. Teach yourself what informal practice feels like. And the, the, the more difficult, challenging formal practice starts to become more understood. You start to understand why it, it can become comforting and a solace. And the other thing I need to say to people in meditation, it's not always meant to be nice. That's the key. And the problem is people expect formal meditation to be, oh, this is going to be really relaxing. And any mindfulness therapist will tell you, if they start telling you it's about relaxation, it's nonsense. It's a side effect, maybe. When you become more accepting of yourself, when you become more aware of yourself, you start to become a little bit more relaxed in your company and your skin. But it's not the reason you do this stuff. So mindfulness is hard. It's challenging. And the reason it's so challenging, Patrick, is because the modern world has conditioned us to be anything but mindful now. It doesn't want us to be mindful. It wants us mindless. Even with breath work, it's so funny. This thing that can be so beneficial to our, to our psychology, to our mental health, to our physical health, We've now turned it into a competition. It's now ego. How long did you hold your breath for? You know, how long did you stay in the cold water for? Oh, three minutes. Oh, now it's everything is ego. And what I say about mindfulness, this isn't about performing. This isn't performative. I don't need to see a picture of you on TikTok meditating. This is your space. Take it. Own it. You need it. And I think that's why it's so powerful and, and, and beneficial. But I think breath work works really well with it. But I think we need to be wary of merging it too much. And I suppose another thing, a person, we kind of have this idea that we're doing something to get a result. Yes. So exactly. there's an issue there because you were going to have ups and downs. Like, I suppose I came across breathing when, but 24, 25 years ago and mindfulness. And I did a couple of the Vipassana courses. Mm. And afterwards, I felt an, an amazing difference, but I kept on checking in with myself. I, for a while, I kept on looking through the filter of the mind. You know, when you talked, you said you're, you're with the company of your, your girlfriend, your partner, and you're, you're really there. You're listening to her. You're drinking the cup of coffee. You're tasting the cup of coffee that you're, you're not absorbed in thought. But initially when we start to bring our attention, we, it's difficult to dissociate from the filter of the mind that are, we're looking through. I don't know if I'm conveying no, you are, yeah. correctly. It's 
it's a very, I find it sometimes it's a difficult idea to put across to somebody that your attention is fully immersed in the present moment. And it's a, it's a period that there, it, there's a sensation, there's, sorry, there's a cessation of thought that it's a period of not thinking, even mm-hmm. though, of course, the mind will come in, but the mind activity is quietened down a little bit. Yeah. How about that filter? Like, I'm just thinking about the person who does it for the first time. What would they expect? Yeah, and it's it's really good. So this idea of diffusing from thoughts. So that the saying we say, you are not your thoughts. And that's a really important thing to understand. Your thoughts, and, and most of us have patterns of thinking. So habitual patterns of thinking. We think the same way. So like, I'll give you a, a prime example. You get clamped, right? In Dublin. Mm. And you get clamped and you look at the clamp and you're like, oh my God, I always get clamped. And then you think to yourself, well, really, I've parked about 3000 times in my life and I've been clamped twice. That doesn't really translate to always. A black and white thinker would go, I always get clamped. And it becomes a habitual way to react to adversity. So they'll go anything when they get don't get a job. For example, they'd go for a job interview. They don't get the job and their immediate instinct is I'm not good enough. Rather than going, maybe there's somebody just a bit better qualified than me at this very moment, or maybe the interviewer got it wrong. So our, our instinct generally is to catastrophize or bring these negative thought patterns. And not all of us have that, but most of us do. And you start to become really, you start to gain a relationship with your thoughts. You start to understand the type of, so I'm an anxious thinker. I always will be. Nothing's ever going to change that about me. But what I used to say is now I, whereas if it's raining, now I'm inside looking at the rain. I'm not outside in the rain. And that's how I look at thoughts. So I can I can look at them now. I can observe them objectively now. And there's days. So if I get anxious one day and I'm really anxious and uncomfortable and I'm sitting in meditation and I start having all these thoughts, I start to realize, okay, that's why I'm anxious. There's a reason for this. There's things I haven't done. I haven't slept. I haven't rested. I've been around shitty people that have made me feel really bad about myself. I've watched too much news. I've watched, you know, And then you start to understand the reason you feel the way you feel. And then you diffuse yourself from that. And that is why mindful. So someone doing this for the first time, when they sit to meditate, I think the biggest mistake people make is that they believe this is about erasing thoughts. It's actually the complete opposite. It's about building a new relationship with thoughts. Now, you might get your Gandhis and Dalai Lamas who can sit there and not think of anything for 50 minutes or an hour. But I don't know anyone else who can do that. I can't. I'm a seasoned meditator. I've been doing it a long time. Every single time I sit to practice, my mind races. And I watch it. And I watch it. And some days it races absolutely very fast. And some days it's grand. And I watch it. And that's the difference. And I'm not married to it. And there's some days I can only do it for 10 minutes. And there's some days where I could sit there for an hour. And feel utterly lost in myself. And then you get to experience things like maybe higher state of consciousness where you you almost feel like you're not part of yourself. That's But the problem is when people meditate, that's what they're seeking all the time. They're seeking that higher form of consciousness. They're probably doing it. And actually, and I've been honest with you, when I've done really functional breath work for a period of time, I've found it easier to get into that state because thoughts become less relevant in functional breathing because you're actually functioning, you're watching a number or you're, you're, you're visualizing a number in your head and you're breathing with it. And then you get st- into states of flow or into higher state of consciousness because your entire brain is moving into the neocortex. It's just, you're coming out of that limbic system response. And that to me is easier. So if I want to get into that state of flow or into that state of almost higher state, it's breathing. It's breathing, breathing, breathing. But if I want to understand why I feel the way I feel or or how I'm how I'm behaving, meditation is a really useful tool. And there's a role for somebody as well to speak with others. You, you know, you spoke about um, I can only think about somebody who's sitting down to meditate and they're flooded with thoughts and they have this mm-hmm. black and white thinking. But it's very difficult sometimes to dissociate because we're often too close to the thoughts ourselves. Mm-hmm. We we don't have that perspective, whereas if you say, if you convey that then to somebody else, it could be a friend, it could be family, it could be a therapist. They'll give you a different side to it. Yeah. Sometimes it's very important to talk. So often is it the talking, the therapist as well, bringing the mindfulness together with that? It's crucial. 
Uh, so what we do in mindfulness based stress reduction or even people who do mindfulness cognitive based therapy, you do a pre-assessment. It's the first thing you do. You assess the person, you see where they're at. So, for example, if you were doing a pre-assessment and somebody wanted to do an eight week mindfulness course and they just lost their brother or a loved one and they're in acute grief, you wouldn't bring them through that process. They're not ready for it. They need to grieve. They need to go through that that torturous and painful human journey that we all go through. Or if it's something else, if it's if there's something there that's traumatic that hasn't been dealt with properly or hasn't even been explored or talked about. So often in our pre-assessment phase, we'll go, I think we need to look at maybe talking to somebody, a therapist, a psychologist to work through this. And absolutely, I think mindfulness could be really useful for you. But maybe right now, let's get you talking first, uh, because what we call that is spiritual bypassing. Spiritual bypassing, John Wellwood writes about it a lot, is when somebody maybe has had something very difficult in their life and they believe by just meditating or focusing on spirituality that this all dissipates and disappear. And actually, it's in every religion. If you look at like Christianity, for example, where something really bad happens and somebody goes, well, it was God's will. Nonsense. You know, that's spiritual bypassing. That's that's constantly doing that. And it's the same in Buddhism and mindfulness. So mindfulness isn't there to bypass trauma. It's not there to bypass pain. A good therapist and a good mindfulness practitioner will pre-assess, will make the decision and always say to that individual, I think mindfulness will be wonderful for you, wonderful for you. But maybe right now it's just too acute. It's too painful for you. And let's figure, figure out what we can do. So I always work with either my partner or somebody else. So if there's somebody there who's my partner's psychologist, I will I will always kind of refer them on to a good psychologist. And some people then can't afford good psychology or can't afford the therapy. And then there, you look at the other options. And then this is when you start getting into systems of support. This is why systems of support are so crucial. You might refer somebody to psychology and they might be told that's 24 months waiting list. And then all of a sudden they come back to you and go, just let me do this because I want to do my, I need to do something to, to, to deal with this. So that's why mental health systems they don't work in silos. They have to work together and they have to work, whether it's a social system or it's an education system or a mental health system. It's easy for me to refer somebody on. It's not so easy for me to make sure they get that care that they deserve and need so they can come through a mindfulness-based stress reduction course safely. It's always about that. And um, that's what I constantly think about in my work. Is this safe? Is this the right thing? And am I the right person to help this person? In terms of children going to school and we spend 12 to 16 years in formal education, we come out of it. We're not trained how to concentrate, nor are we trained how to adequately deal with stress. We're not trained how to step out of the mind, how to quieten the mind. Um, where's where's it all going? I know you touched on this earlier on. I often feel sometimes breathing is so simple it, it has been overlooked. But paying attention to the mind Yes. You no, know, it, it's I know it's it's not so straightforward, but then what's the alternative? The alternative yeah. is living in one's head. Yeah, so you live that cerebral. I think the other important thing is you can get too cerebral. You can get too into the mind. Like a big part of mindfulness is getting you into the body. It's to get you to feel the mind body connection. You know, I always say to people, if your mind is just too busy, if it's rinsing you, if it it's your mind isn't going to be the thing that that slows that down. Your mind will keep going, but your body will. That's why I always say to people, when you get anxious, where in your body do you feel the anxiety? And even in that question, they kind of go, oh, never been asked that before. Oh, I feel it in my chest. Okay, put your hand there. I want you to breathe into that part of your body. And I want you just to focus on nothing else but that part of your body and just feel yourself warming into it. And what you're doing is essentially slowing their brain down. You're mm -hmm. slowing down that that cycle of of rinsing, as I call it, or that mind riot, as I call it as well. Y you know, I, the riot police, I call them, is the is the body. Bring in the body and the body will always be there to support the mind. It's They're not independent of each other. We need to stop thinking like that. So even you know that through the physiology of the body and the mind, the brain, they work in a cycle constantly. And we need to, we need to understand that. The other thing with kids. So I think breath work is crucial for children because most children in primary schools probably won't have developed most of them that kind of maybe negative panic relationship with the breath that I would have by 13, 14 years of age. So there's a really good time to get into the functionality of breathing with children and help them, which is what Alice for Life, which is my charity uh, that I co-founded. That's name it. 
a, a lust for life, a lust for life, a lust for life. Yeah, and is so we we've now reached fifty thousand students, uh, primary school students in Ireland, okay. and our our aim is every school in Ireland by the end of next year and internationally. We're already looking at Scotland. We're looking at America. I'm traveling there this month. My PhD is in the evaluation of this program. How can we actually de design early intervention programs? Early intervention programs do a couple of things. They, they start to normalize emotions. So kids understand that the full spectrum of emotion from the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, sadness, happiness, joy, nervousness, anxiety, anger, all these things are all of us. Every one of us have these. And I think when I was growing up, the only emotion we were allowed to express was happiness or joy. We weren't allowed to express the other core emotions, which were sadness, which were, you know, anger, which mm. was anxiety. So what we're doing with the programs is teaching young kids that all of this matters. And how do you express that? And not only express that, what's the functional thing you can do to deal with that? Whether it's talking or understanding or there's a breathing pattern. And say one of the most effective supports for children is box breathing. They, they just love it. And they just, because it's so visual, it's so simple. They can do it in the classroom on their own when no one's looking. You don't even know you're doing it half the time. So that's part of our program. Our program is mindfulness, emotional intelligence. We look at how you communicate. And that to me is why I'm passionate about early intervention, because in Ireland and across the world, health systems around mental health operate what we call a crisis management. It's, they're, they're, they're sick systems. They're not health systems. They wait for you to hit point of crisis before they intervene. And not only that, when they do intervene, it's generally, it's not particularly effective because it just, unfortunately, in many, many cases, the medical model is the only show in town. And to me, early intervention, we've done this for years. My PhD is looking at the historical interventions that we have used from institutionalization to deep medicalization to the ignoring of trauma where we basically took people who've been traumatized and we numbed them and we put them into institutions away from anyone else that is not how you treat vulnerable people and what i'm trying to do is if, if those interventions aren't the answer what is to me early intervention is a huge part of that give kids tools to deal with the the ins and outs, ups and downs of life, because life is not a straight line. And one of those core tools is functional breathing and mindfulness meditation. But when we're doing mindfulness meditation with kids, <laughs> we're not getting into the nitty gritty of it. We're not getting mm. into that. You know, you can't. You have to be careful with your language. So what I would talk to kids about, I would say to a kid, I said, do you ever, do you ever get anxious? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, what makes you anxious? And they'll tell you. And then you validate that anxiety and you'll say something like, oh, yeah, I get that too. Like, I used to hate going to swimming pools or something like that. And you could see it and I'm like, oh, my God. I said, like, yeah, it's like, oh, and where do you feel it? And it, all of a sudden, it's this lovely conversation where you're validating their fears and you're giving them a solution or an idea. But the other thing that's important, Patrick, is you can't solve all their problems. They need to solve them themselves. You can't wrap kids in, bu in bubble wrap. Life is hard sometimes and you can't fix all the problems. And we teach that too. So, yeah, I think our health systems unfortunately when it comes to mental health really tend to around the world operate the same way and we're not long out of where we just institutionalized everybody ireland and then ireland for example in the 50s and 60s had the highest level of coercive confinement in psychiatric institutions in the world well wow. and you can joke about that and say Irish people were just Mad. had more mental health issues, than it, but that's just not true. There's no evidence whatsoever to show it. So if you're going to study psychology and mental health, if you don't look at the social forces and the sociological forces of it, you are missing a beat. That is where you get so many answers. Why did we do that to people? Why did we institutionalize? Why did we numb people who just needed help? Mm. We're still doing that in many cases. And I think that's why people like Gabor Mate and, you know, people who talk about trauma informed care. The first question we should be asking anybody is not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you? What happened to you? What happened to you? Ireland has had a dark history where we've a lot of trauma that we need to work through. And, and that's the work I want to do. And I think that is why the combination of, of functionality and breath work and mindfulness and meditation can allow us. It's not the answer. Mm -hmm. It's it's a I think it's a I think it's a core part of it, but there's much more to it. But 
it's the thing I know most about. Yeah, of course. I can't help just think about a study by Karen Bonnock, and she looked at 11,000 children in Stratford-upon-Avon in the UK from the ages of six months to 57 months. And children with sleep issues, including snoring, mouth breathing, and sleep apnea, whereby they stop breathing during sleep. Mm. These kids, if untreated by age five, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. Now, she put it down to that the brain of a young child develops during the formative years and the brain develops during sleep. But mm. if the child, for example, is having a sleep disruption, and I know you wrote a book recently, I think it was called mm. a sleep scan mm -hmm. for children, that if the child is having sleep disruptions, it's preventing their brain for, for, from developing normally. So I can't help but think that the sleep quality of the child is actually influencing their mental health for the rest of their life because of the development of the brain and that's totally overlooked now nobody it's is massively looking at overlooked. It. i think the the other element of that is so we talk a lot about hypervigilance in kids so hypervigilance is the the idea that their brains are being put into a certain place for a certain period of the day and hypervigilance is crucially important to the brain and you know we are we need to be hypervigilant but the pro the problem is kids find themselves everything they see is framed in threat and risk you know for the last three years for example there's a lot of young kids in ireland now experiencing things like obs obsessive compulsive disorder what hand washing because all they've watched now for and when i was a kid i just didn't have that much information coming at me it just didn't exist and now it's re like but the one thing i will say before we jump into the attacking on things like computer games there is also evidence out there to say that they're deeply deeply brilliant at connecting kids and allowing them communicating and um, i think there's an immediate you know scapegoat that we look for when it comes to kids and hypervigilance but the reality is kids brains aren't designed to be uh, absorbing information all the time they're not they're their kids default setting is presence that's that's generally where kids that's how they explore their surroundings that's how they build their emotional intelligence they need to be connecting with people and they need all that kind of stuff. We know that that's just, it's, it's, it's crucially true. But if you're, if you, if you, a child is in a hypervigilant state for the majority of the day, you can't just expect them to turn into sleep when it comes to eight o'clock or nine o'clock. Their, their entire central nervous system is telling them they have to prepare for something for long periods of the day. And then you're going, go to sleep now. And I think the key is with young kids is to, is to teach them, teach, teach the understanding how do we get them out of that hypervigilant state how do we get them to a point where they're not they're not absorbing information all the time where they're not having to do homework you know even elements like that when you come home after a busy day of work of school where you're whatever you finish school at two three o'clock and um, play a bit and then you have to get the the, the hypervigilance i've got to do my homework now and i think play is really important to children i think connection is really important to children but I think understanding that sleep above everything is 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 crucially important to a child. And if they're hypervigilant for, for eight to 10 hours a day, it becomes more difficult. People often think hypervigilance can make us sleepy or tired or exhaust us. I don't think that's true. No, if no, it becomes your so. default setting and it's you just feel that hyper anxiety or hyper arousal all the time, mm. you, your body starts to believe that that's just the way things are. And I'm the same. I can notice when I uh, study. I love studying. I love well, studying brings me to a different. I'm not hypervigilant when I study. I'm very focused and I, it tires me out a lot. What makes me hypervigilant is when I go on social media, when I look at the news, when I try to make sense of a senseless world. world. That makes me hypervigilant. When I start to worry, what if that person does that? That's what makes and. What makes me hypervigilant is when I look at my phone. And what I've started to realize in meditation is, okay, that's the thing that it gets me anxious. What what doesn't get me anxious? Connecting with people. I love I love chats. I love chats with good people. Love it. But I also love I love educating myself. I love taking a book. I'm reading a book at the moment, a masculinity called Up Boys and Men. And I'm reading it going, I love read. I love this. Because mm -hmm. I'm focused, I'm in the moment, and I'm mindful. Yes, I might be reading something. Mindfulness is not about sitting there listening to well music. It's about being utterly submerged and immersed in your moment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes reading is one of the best ways to do that. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think kids need to understand, parents need to understand that a hypervigilant brain doesn't just switch off because you tell it to. 
it, it needs to be taught. And that's why breathing, functional breathing is, that's why I say to kids, I'll tell you a great story, Patrick. I'd, um, I was flying to the States before COVID and um, I have one of these breathing techniques, kind of mindfulness breathing techniques called the magic moment. And it, it involves using your fingers and your breath. And we were, we were, I don't know, I never sleep in planes. And this particular day, I was like, oh my God, I'm falling asleep here. This is lovely. This, this flight, I'll be wake up and I'll be in America. And I could sense somebody was looking at me. And I was like, oh, I, I, I could feel somebody was beside this, the seat. And I opened my eyes and there was just this little kid doing this little breathing pattern that I taught them. And she goes, I don't like flying. And I went, oh, come here. I tell you what, sit down there beside me and I'll, I'll teach you a few more just to kind of get her to distract mm -hmm. her. And she was like, oh, amazing. So I sat her down and I taught her a few other, all just functional breathing for a child. 10 minutes later, this girl was asleep and I was wide awake going, oh my God, I was thinking to myself, <laughs> but it shows you, they're sponges. They, they, yeah. they, you, you tell a child, this will help you. I promise you this will be good for you. Try this. They'll believe you. And a good role model or a good adult saying, I'll do it with you. Let's do it. Mm. And I think that to me is the single best way to support children. Yeah, I often think about breathing. The role model is really important. You're you're that role model. And also for children to hear it from many different aspects. They need to hear it in school. They need yeah. to hear it in their sporting environment. And the one thing about breathing for kids, you can bring it into any endeavor. Even asking a child to run with their mouth closed or jog with their mouth closed is a breathing exercise. It's helping their breathing from a biochemical dimension, from a biomechanical dimension. Yeah. I'm just conscious of time, but I'm going to go full circle. I have a 12 year old child mm -hmm. in terms of social media and TikTok, um, time is spent on that. And yeah, for me, I'm, I don't be too impressed with it, put it that way. Yeah. What does a parent do when you, when you have a child uh, of that age, they have an iPhone. She has an iPhone now one year for one year. Some kids are having it from the age of nine. What does a parent do? Do you set limits on the phone? You don't want to be a broken record. You don't want to be causing aggro as a result of the child is too much on the phone. What's the practical intervention here, do you think? Or? I think, I mean, there's a lot of incredible kind of commentators in this area of social media and kids. And I think we can very quickly turn it into scapegoat. The one thing I I feel, now I'm not a parent, right? Let's, let's be clear. I don't think I am. Maybe I am, but I, I don't think I am. <laughs> Year, years of touring might catch up with me one day. But I, I think about this a lot. And one thing I know as myself, as a child, I know my nephew, Billy, and I, 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 I work with children all the time. The last thing you can do is, is force a child to do something that that's that, that is, that will turn them straight away, especially something they enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important part. So the first question I think I always say to Billy is like, what do you think is fair? What do you think is fair? So I put it all on that, on him. So it's my, my nephew's 10. I was like, what do you think is fair? And, he, and if I'm looking after him, for example, and he goes, well, and he will say, I'd like to use it for two hours. I'm like, OK, I think that's a little bit too much. How about and then, and all of a sudden he feels like he's in control of this conversation. And he's now he, all of a sudden he's like Richard Branson. He's like an <laughs> entrepreneur and he's he's negotiating with me. And I said, OK, no problem. I tell you what, I think 90 minutes is fair. How? And he goes, OK. And all of a sudden it becomes a, an empowering conversation for him because he's in control of it. And what I'd also do with Billy is I talk him through certain elements of social media that I, I think are great, that I love. That's the first thing I said. Oh, oh man, TikTok's hilarious. I, I Some of the stuff I've seen on that, I fell off the chair laughing, which is true. Like some mm. of it is hilarious. Some of it's witty, it's entertaining and it's fun. Some of it's dark, destructive and dangerous. And I say that to him. I said, what I want to do is talk to you. How do we, how do we figure out the difference? So he goes, okay. So I said, if something comes on TikTok that makes you, makes you think, right. I want you to, I literally, I said to him, I want you to, um, to, to, to show to me, let me know what you, what I think. And I will tell him, I, I think this is, and I will explain to him. So it becomes very educational. I am not forcing him not to use it, mm. but I'm education, edu educating him on how to use it and how to process stuff. And another thing, like there's things that he had said with me, I use him as a very, because I can, I can use him because he is my nephew. I'm not, and, and I can't talk about other people we would have done stuff with. But other thing, I remember saying to him, I, I like, this is where we have to be really careful. He had this deep anxiety for a period of time and we didn't know where it was coming from and we were worried about it. And he, so I made a decision to say to Billy, I'm going to pick you up from school at, uh, Friday and I'm going to pick you up every Friday. And 
he loves me picking him up. I said, but there's only one rule. You need to talk to me for 15 minutes and I'm not allowed to talk at all. And he's like, OK. So he got into the car and he talk and he talk and he talk. And I found out why he was anxious. He was terrified my sister wouldn't pick him up from school. So now we're getting into things like attachment and that fear. And mm. I went, oh, instead of going, of course, she's going to pick you up from school, Billy. I went, oh, yeah, that'd be scary. Oh, I can understand why you'd be anxious about that. But I promise you one thing. I'll tell you what. I'm going to give the teacher my number. So if it ever does happen, I'll be there. Mm. And all of a sudden, I validated his fear. I've given him a solution or a support, something he can work around. And then I asked him, you know, why did you get so scared about it? He saw it on TikTok. He saw a, a kid who didn't get picked up from school. And it was it was actually a joke. The kid was left there for two hours and it was a thing. And it played in his yeah. head. And and this is what I'm talking about. There's real life consequences to children looking at this stuff. And we, we as adults have to find a way to better educate them and the education system, which is what the Lust for Life program does as well. We do a, a full module on how you how you actually process social media how you understand it. I worked with a load of teenagers on Monday in a youth cafe about this, about social media and the different things of how they process it. And like the same thing, like one of the big issues we see among teenagers is porn. Mm -hmm. Porn is one of the biggest problems now because they're, they're, you're accelerating their sexuality. They're not ready. They're not mature enough to deal with things like rejection and all the other stuff that comes with it. So, we can't stop it now, Patrick. That's the reality. The juggernaut is out of the stable and it's gone. But we can educate them how to deal with it. That is all we can do now. And I, I do think you can set boundaries, but the, the way you have that conversation with your, with your child isn't going, you're not using it. It's like, what do you think? I always put it back on the, on the other person to empower them, to make them feel like they've solved the problem. And you gain respect, you gain understanding. And then, the problem is then when it comes to 90 minutes and you go to take the iPad off him and it's like ripping a ball <laughs> off Josh van de Fleer in the rugby match. You just look at him and go, that's not fair, Billy. That's not fair. And he goes, and he'll be a bit grumpy for a minute. And he goes, no, you're right. But that's the relationship I build with him. And that's a negotiation. And it, it's on him. But then again, there's, that's him. This That's subjective to him. I, you know, there's parents, there's all kids aren't the same. But I do think uh, empowering and understanding and also understanding your kids' needs. What kids, what needs do your child have? You know, kids might have other needs that Billy doesn't, you know, maybe, you know, they need that space or whatever. But the other thing I do is I teach them to read. I love them reading. Um, but the the big thing is 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 YouTube. That's where I, he turns into a zombie. Like he puts on YouTube and it's just these guys shouting at a screen and he turns into an utter zombie. That's where I get worried because I could be in the room doing cartwheels and he wouldn't see me. So that's not normal. And yeah. I don't really have a solution to that. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Niall, you've been a tremendous ambassador for mental health in Ireland and now internationally. And well done. Thank you very much. For people who want to, to look a little bit more into your work, you mentioned your websites and how can people find you? Yeah, I mean, uh, check out the Where Is My Mind podcast. It's on all um, podcast platforms. I'm on the Lemonada Media Network. So check that out. I mean, we 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 explore all different subjects. We have meditation support programs there. Uh, it's the best way to kind of get a gist of what it is I do. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in the charity and the work that we're doing, lustforlife.com is our charity. You can see our schools program. We have reached millions of people in the work that we do. Uh, and also nilbreslin.com is my website and happy to reach out. And I think also like I think it's important to highlight that the work that you do as well for me was really, really supportive. I didn't understand. I didn't understand Brett work the way I needed to understand it, to be able to better educate other people and support other people through it. And it was actually working with you that made me kind of go, right, I need to learn more here. I need to understand this from every angle. And I think that's what makes this type of work brilliant. People work and listen to each other and learn off each other. That's kind of what we do. Bring it all together. Yeah. 100%. Great stuff. Thanks, Take care, Patrick. Take care.